There are a lot of reasons why I love the Ganbare Goemon series, and one is that despite their general high quality, the games are still pretty easy to find and inexpensive. In Japan, at least. Of course, not all Ganbare Goemon games were created equal, and there are a few, let's say, less than stellar titles in the library. And not every Goemon game is a cheap pickup, either. The futuristic reboot on the original PlayStation has started to climb up in price, and its Game Boy Advance counterpart is so hard to find in pricey now that it's beyond the range of most average collectors. The other GBA Goemon title comprising of ports of the first two Super Famicom titles is also one of the more cost-prohibitive entries, but that's mostly because almost anything that's good on the handheld is expensive now. Among these Goemon games that fetch a premium on the market is another handheld title released all the way back in the year 2000. Ganbare Goemon Seikushi Dynamites Arawaru Published by Konami on December 12, 2000, Ganbare Goemon Seikushi Dynamite Arawaru, or The Appearance of the Warrior of the Starry Skies, Dynamites, is the fifth and final Goemon title released for the 8-bit Game Boy family, and the only one produced exclusively for Game Boy Color systems. It was developed by KCEK, Konami Computer Entertainment Kobe, consisting of a small staff that included people such as Tomio Tomita as sound producer, Keita Kawaminami as director and one of two co-producers, and Shigeharu Umezaki as executive producer, who was also a programmer on Karakuri Dolchu and its sequel. The other co-producer on this game was Etsunobu Ebisu, the literal face of Ebisumaru, who had formed the dev studio Goodfeel after ending his long stint at Konami, bringing along several of his colleagues including those mentioned just now. With the first Game Boy Goemon, Sarawarete Ibisamaru, featuring gameplay similar to Ganbare Goemon 2 on the Famicom, and the handheld games that followed being a Zelda-like adventure game and two RPGs, I think it's pretty clear that with this project the developers aim to bring some of the magic from the extremely popular Super Famicom entries to the small screen. While the finished product doesn't quite stand up to the high bar set by its console counterparts, the talented team at KCEK probably succeeded the best they could given the resources provided by Konami and the hardware they were working on, which was essentially a modified version of a 10-year-old platform at that point. And this resulted in a pretty good action game on the GBC, the first handheld Goemon to not only properly implement the series' signature side-scrolling stages, but also the fast-paced first-person impact battles that Goemon fans around the world know and love. When things have settled down from the last crisis in the lands of Oedo, the dynamic duo of Goemon and Ibisumaru can finally enjoy some much-deserved downtime. Goemon heads down to the sunny south in order to compete in a Koban coin throwing competition, utilizing the special talent that he's honed over the years. And Ibisumaru heads up to the snowy north to participate in a speed eating contest, utilizing the special talent that he's honed over the years. Oh my. But shortly after they leave the town of Hagoremachi and embark on their trips, an unidentified object casts a shadow over the city and a mysterious and booming voice broadcasts an announcement to the people of Oedo. This voice belongs to the commander of the cat-shaped flying saucer, the titular Starry Sky Warrior Dynamites. He has traveled vast distances across space, hailing from the Seifukusei, or the Conquest Planet, and proclaims himself to be the King of Conquest. Unsurprisingly, his reason for coming to Earth is to succeed where so many others have failed, and that is to take over and subjugate the planet according to his divine will, starting off with the island nation of Japan. This kind of thing just keeps on happening to these poor people. The mechanical ninja Sasuke and the Kunoichi Yae witness the coming of this new terror firsthand, and set off to find Goemon and Ibisumaru to aid them in dispatching the dastardly dynamites. Starting up a new game gives players the option of playing as either Goemon or Ibisumaru, who begin the adventure at opposite ends of Japan on a world map that's just like the one found in Ganbare Goemon 2 on the Super Famicom. If you're familiar with that game, you've already realized that the setup for this game's story is also quite similar, with a vacation unfortunately interrupted by the abrupt arrival of a foreign menace. And regardless of which character you start with, entering the first stage will confirm that Seikushi Dynamite's Arawaru is doing its best to follow in the footsteps of its console cousins, not just visually but audibly as well since the majority of the game's music consists of arranged tracks from the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th 16-bit Goemon titles. Take a listen to some comparisons here.
Dynamite has sent out his legion of mechanical cats, the Karakuri Neko army, to wreak havoc on the Oedo populace, and being in a state of chaos obviously means that all events and competitions must be postponed. Greatly angering Goemon and Ibisumaru and driving them to fight back even harder to destroy the invading robotic forces, thwart the villainous schemes of Dynamites, and save the people of Japan yet again. The flow of gameplay is similar to other games in the series, with several areas made up of action stages and towns, requiring the defeat of a boss before moving on to the next area. Goemon titles have never really had complicated control schemes, so the Game Boy Color's limited amount of buttons actually complements the gameplay quite well. In normal levels, one button is used to attack, and another to jump, and pressing select will switch between melee and projectile weapons. As always, Goemon strikes his foes with his trusty Kisiru pipe and utilizes Koban coins to take out enemies from afar at the cost of one coin, logically. Ibisumaru tosses Shuriken for his projectile attack, and this time his melee weapon is a Mampuku Kota, a very large and surprisingly battle effective spatula. The goal of any action stage is simply to reach the end of the path, but of course the journey is filled with dangers in the form of enemies, pitfalls, and other environmental hazards. The hordes of Robocats and bad guys will occasionally drop money or Dongo health power-ups, both of which are also found scattered about each stage, including a golden Dongo that restores the life bar completely. Elephant statues act as checkpoints in certain levels, and picking up an Oiri Bukuro will add to the pool of player lives. Losing all lives results in a game over, which like other games is no big deal, as the only real penalty is cutting cash in half if you choose to continue. The player starts off with 3 life bars, allowing for a total of 6 standard hits before losing a life. However, collecting 5 golden lucky cats will add one more bar. There are 15 of these statues in total found throughout various stages, some a bit tricky to find and some sitting around in plain sight. And when all are acquired, the life bar is doubled. In addition to the golden variety of these cat statues are two other types. Discovering all five silver cats will upgrade Goemon's standard pipe and transform it into the fire pipe, making it stronger. Strong enough to break through certain rock walls that tend to block access to valuable treasures, often found by backtracking to early levels. Obtaining five black cats endows Ibisumaru with the ability to become Chibi Ibisumaru, just like in Goemon 3 for the Super Famicom, turning the portly ninja Piwi tiny enough to pass through small gaps which also tend to be in the way of obtaining fantastic items. Since action stages are so much like Gambara Goemon 2 or 4 on the Super Famicom, it's no surprise that towns also follow suit. Inns are where you save the game, but also allow you to rest and recuperate life. However, instead of choosing the class of room for your stay, it's randomly selected for you, affecting how much life you recover. Eating establishments offer a range of meals for sale that also replenish health, and general stores provide life-saving rice balls and two types of armor to increase the odds of surviving the tricky road ahead. As usual, annoying thieves roam the streets trying to pick your pockets, town beauties do the complete opposite for <laughs> some reason, and Vice is there to serve and protect the victims of random acts of violence from our supposed heroes. And the regular townsfolk are around to chat with as well, giving the latest gossip and other bits of info that aren't always relevant to the adventure, but more solid hints and tips can be learned from a visit to a fortune teller, for a small price. Each town pretty much serves the exact same purpose, though a couple are home to some unique attractions, which we'll go over later. One last thing about towns, I will say that I do appreciate that each one has its own unique look, not only with the architecture, but with their residents as well. Goemon begins his journey in Nangoku, way down south in Kyushu, and travels north to make his way back home. The tropical stages here feature beautiful sunny locales and equally beautiful sunsets. The final level here is a theme park with ferris wheel platforming sections that eventually leads to a spooky town enshrined by bamboo trees and inhabited by yokai, Japanese spirits and monsters. At the end of the paths, one of Dynamite's minions, Nyampon, stands in Goemon's way, quickly transforming into a gigantic robotic lucky cat. And that means it's boss time. This large metal feline looks intimidating, but its weak point is the bell on its collar, and with enough blunt force trauma, he goes down without much effort. Once he's been defeated, Goemon must trek across the sprawling desert sands until he finally comes across a tea house in central Japan, where he decides to rest up before continuing on. The player then takes control of Ibisumaru, who is currently in Yukiguni, all the way north in Hokkaido, where he must brave the freezing temperatures through mounds of fluffy snow as well as the slippery surfaces of solid tundra. The final stage in this area is an icy fortress comprised of tricky platforming due to the icy floors as well as the classic platforming game hazard, spiked ceilings. 
Passage to warmer climates is blocked by another of Dynamite's minions, Nyahuba, who turns into a floating octopus-like mechanical monstrosity. This boss is encased in ice, making him impervious to standard damage, but sending a few fireballs his way via some machines that just conveniently pop up from time to time melts this barrier, leaving the giant robo vulnerable to normal attacks. After dismantling the motorized pest, Abisumaru continues south through the heart of a lush forest, but is stopped in his tracks when he reaches an enormous waterfall. There he meets Yae, who tells him she has been looking all over for our heroic sidekick, exciting the chubby ninja as he misinterprets the meeting as a possible romantic rendezvous. The serious Kunoichi sets the record straight and then updates him on the situation in Hagoremachi with Seikushi Dynamites in his campaign of conquest. This also excites Abisumaru as he mistakes the villain's name as Sexy Dynamites. Never change, my fat funny friend. After correcting him once again, Yai offers to help scale the waterfall with her mermaid magic, and the gameplay shifts from platformer to vertical scrolling shooter. The roaring waters are littered with danger, but Yai is more than capable of overcoming the aquatic onslaught of the Katakuri Neko army. Beyond the waterfall is the tea house where the two heroes finally meet up and the real quest begins. Pausing the game now will allow the player to switch between Goemon Ibisumaru or Chibi Ibisumaru if unlocked. Unlike most other Goemon games, however, there are no real differences between the two aside from attack animations, though Ibisumaru's spatula is stronger than Goemon's pipe before the upgrade. The newly reunited duo makes their way down a steep and deadly mountain path in order to reach Goemon's hometown of Hagunemachi. When they finally arrive though, they find that it has been completely overrun by the Karakuri Neko army and transformed into a technologically advanced cat metropolis. The true citizens of the town are nowhere to be found, and all the heroes can do is move forward and kick robotic cat tail along the way. Near the outskirts of this new Hagunemachi is yet another minion of dynamites, Hagane-chan. Goemon inquires into the whereabouts of his kind of sort of girlfriend, Omitsu, to which this female cat robot replies she is cuter than the missing town idol. To prove her cuteness, she morphs into a giant cat girl robot in a kimono with a deadly arsenal of flying rocket hands, fireballs that explode into pillars of flames, bursts of electric shock, and arms powerful enough to generate tornadoes. Adorable! <laughs> After breaking her steel heart, you discover an elevator shaft going down, landing you on what may just be an express train to hell. Don't get zapped by the beam of fire unless you like game over screens. After the bumpy ride, the two arrive at a primitive underground Hagunemachi, which is where the Karakuni Neko army have displaced the residents of the overworld town via the elevator and train you just rode in on. Oh yeah, and Omitsu is here, safe, sound, and working as always. Aside from the usual shops, there's a whole section of town that's all about having a good time. Well, a PG-rated good time anyway. You can play any of five minigames here and win some rather large piles of Koban coins for your efforts, continuing the long-running tradition of the Goemon series. There's one where you hit the correct buttons to make fireworks go off, one where you must correctly guess the orientation of a spinning picture of a lucky cat, Another was a button mashing speed eating contest that would make even Kobayashi sweat. There's a fun river raft obstacle course. And finally a game where you must spot the odd dancing octopus out. While there's unfortunately no co-op play in this handheld title, it does support two-player competitive play with these minigames via the Game Boy Color's Link functionality, accessed from a special comlink center located in this prehistoric Hagoremachi. From here you'll need to traverse the red-hot subterranean caverns, paying special attention to the ebb and flow of molten lava, as it's one of those touch-it-and-you're-dead kinds of hazards, as it very well should be. Past all that is another elevator that goes back up to the surface, where Sasuke awaits. A sea of sky and robotic cats separates the heroes from Dynamite's spaceship, giving the mechanical ninja an opportunity to soar with his unique flight capabilities. The player takes control of Sasuke in a shooting section much like with Yae, except his level scrolls horizontally.
only a short but treacherous path through the flying fortress stands between the heroes and a confrontation with dynamites. And when the villain is finally met, well, more punny dialogue as you'd expect, but also a demand to restore Hagurimachi to its former glory. The intergalactic conqueror of worlds threatens the heroes with a powerful secret weapon, but he forgot it, so he runs off. And then... The first impact battle in this game is against the Rokat V3, and if you've ever played an impact boss segment in the other games, you'll know exactly what to do here. You have a set amount of fuel and Koban coins to keep you going through the fight. Fuel acts as hit points and the coins can be shot out as projectiles. More coins can be obtained by punching enemy projectiles with impact's mighty spherical fists, which can also slowly but surely chip away at the opponent's energy. Special attacks like kicks, uppercuts, and the almighty 100 strike punch can be performed with certain button combinations, as well as the super shot when a special gauge fills up when enough hits connect. <laughs> It's all very fun as you'd expect, and when the power of impact prevails, Dynamites finally makes an escape, leaving Earth's atmosphere, heading toward the moon. I know I've spoiled enough so I'll let you discover what happens after this, but I will say that it involves some low-grav platforming, space bunnies, a zero-grav chamber, another epic impact boss battle, and a silly and not all that satisfying ending that should be expected from this series. And that's Gambare Goemon Seikushi Dynamite's Arawaru for the Game Boy Color. It's a pretty short adventure, easily completed in about 3 hours or so, and that's fine for a portable title. After the credits roll, you can replay Yaya and Sasuke's shooting stages by speaking with a fortune teller, and following the craze of the era, there's a kind of collection component in Dynamite's in the form of picture cards of all the enemies you defeated, viewable at a library in the town in Nangoku. Other than that, a couple of stages open up that are essentially impact and action stage boss rushes, challenging the player to beat each boss with default stats and no recovery in between fights. The only thing you get for accomplishing either are congratulatory victory pictures, and since there are so few bosses, both are accomplished pretty easily. And that's kind of a theme throughout Seikushi Dynamite's Arawaru. It's pretty easy. Maybe the easiest title in the entire Goemon series. However, that doesn't take away from the game's quality, and I'd rank it as the second best of the 8-bit Goemon handheld titles. Though looking at the series as a whole, it probably lands somewhere in the middle, which isn't so bad as the upper tier titles are amazingly good. Aside from an official strategy guide, as far as I know there wasn't any sort of special merchandise that came about because of this game, and it didn't get any reprints. Well, aside from being a part of the Nintendo Power Game Boy flashcard service. I think that were this game released a little earlier as an original Game Boy title, it would have been more popular than it was, and I can only dream of similar short but sweet adventures that might have followed in portable form. But as it stands, Gambare Goemon Seikushi Dynamite's Arawaru is mostly a collector's item for Goemon fans that carries a price tag that's a bit more hefty than the rest of the games in the series. Perhaps more than ever, video game fans across the world have been hoping for and speculating on a Gambare Goemon revival for modern platforms, and I think it will happen eventually. And when it finally does go down, I can't think of another team that would do it justice better than the previously mentioned Good Feel, who has been producing wonderful action platform style games for Nintendo systems for years after the company's formation. Let's hope that happens, or at the very least that it happens at all, done by a team that knows, loves, and respects the legacy of the Gambare Goemon series, and has the talent to make something just as amazing or better than what came before. Anyway, that's all for this episode of Import Gaming for the Win. As always, I'm Jimmy Hoppe, and you take care.